don't deserve it, He's good. When we messed up, He's still good. When we forgot to pray, seek His face, He's still good. No matter what you and I do, it doesn't change whether He's good or bad. He's always good. No matter the society that you and I live in trying to paint Him to be somebody He's not, He's still good. His mercy endures forever. There's no beginning, there's no ending with Him. And I wonder if there ever come a moment in you, in my life, that we could really believe the words that we say. His mercy endures forever. If we were to begin to think about what He has done for us and where He has saved us from and the, the goodness that He has bestowed upon us, what a difference our worship would be. We sing songs that He's a good, good Father. We sing songs of Jesus, I love you. We sing songs of all the olds and all the news. And at some point, there's going to come a day where you and I get to sing it, not just in a church service. We get to sing it. Why? Because His mercy endures forever. And I can't wait for that day. I long for the day that everything that we've ever preached about, everything that we've ever been taught about comes to pass. And no matter the society that's out there that tries to cancel the Bible, try to cancel anything that they don't agree with, well, there's one thing they'll never cancel. The love of God and who He is. Because He is love. And so today I want to talk to you about faith because it's going to have to take faith for you and I to sustain this society in which you and I live. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. And again, let me thank you for attending today. And on behalf of First Lady, I know they and my family miss being here and they're doing everything they can to ensure your safety is they're tuned in no doubt but in Hebrews chapter 5 we see something that begins to take place in verse 12 the Bible says and for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. And that is, those who, by reason of use of their senses, exercise to discern both good and evil. And if you'll flip to Luke chapter 8. Verse 22, the Bible says, and now it happened. On a certain day that he goes into a boat with his disciples and he said, let us cross over to the other side. And they launched out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep and the wind of the storms came on the lake and they were filling up with water. The boat was and they were in jeopardy. And they came and awoke in him and saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose, rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid. And they marveled. They said one to another, Who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the storms, and they obey him. I want to talk today on that question that he asked his own disciples. 
where is your faith? You may be seated. And it's the faith that you and I have that we have to believe that the words that Jesus said that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And the enemy will come and plague our minds and the enemy will come constantly at you and I in the battle that rages and uh, attacks us. But one of the things that you and I need to understand is that God is always the deliverer of his word. No matter what he has bestowed upon you or bestowed upon me, it is never a mistake or it is never a, uh, a, a circumstance of where I thought I meant this, but I meant this. And he has never misspoken in his life. The words of the Lord you can take to the bank if you use that old adage, but we have to believe that what he says is going to happen. Could you imagine the day of the disciples and they wake up Jesus? What did you think he was going to do? I don't think they thought he was going to speak to the wind and the storms. I don't think that he thought that he was going to calm it down because they asked the question. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the storms obey him? What did they possibly think Jesus was going to do? Help them row the boat? Help them throw the water out? But Jesus, in his awesome power, once again wants to show that no matter what you think I'm going to do, I can exceed your expectations. And it is the faith that you have in me that just trusts me and let me do what I do best. And that is going beyond what you think I'm capable of and taking care of your problems. And in the midst of a trial and circumstance, Jesus wakes up out of his sleep and just simply says, Oh, ye of little faith, where is it? And just says, storm, stop. Wind, cease. And they're now resting in the calmness of the water. And I'm here today to tell somebody that Jesus sent me by to tell you that all you have to do is have faith. The storm that you're battling, Jesus is in your boat. Just sometimes you have to quit trying to throw the water out and just go to him. He's in the boat for a reason. He's waiting on you to come to him. But too often we want to do things our own way. Well, I see him. I just don't want to bother him. You ever been that part? I, 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 he's my lad. I just want to let him sleep. He's had a long day, and I just want to let him sleep. I think I got this taken care of, only to find out you don't have it taken care of. You're in a mess, and you need to go to the master of the sea. You know, we sing that song, I know the master of the wind. But we don't want to go to him. We sing the song to anchor holds, but we don't want that. We only want those as last resorts. Why do we go to God as last? If we have faith in him, should we not go to him first? See, we have to understand things like this. The world has politically criticized us and tries to make us be politically correct in everything that we do. But I would much rather be spiritually correct than politically correct. 
I'm not here to pacify somebody in a pew. I'm here to ensure that you make eternity your destination. And if that means somebody being mad at me on this side, but being glorified on that side, then praise be Jesus' name. It is this that we live and die. He died on a cross so that you and I could live. We're not here so that we can pack a pew. We're here so we can pack heaven. At the end of the day, Jesus is the one that receives all the glory. See, one prophet tried to search him out and look, but we find this. In fact, it says in the beginning. He was from the very beginning. Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, there is nobody before him. And if you're trying to manipulate God, you're not going to manipulate God because God created all things. He's the creator of all things. Listen, he says, I am the alpha and the omega. I am the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I am he that is and was and I am which is to come, the almighty. So we got to quit trying to play the games with God. You were not first in line. You don't know all things. David even says, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. He is unchangeable. Everlasting, eternal. He is sovereign and, and he is complete all by himself. You don't complete God. I told this in the marriage conference. You know, we always want to say, you know, well, you love that Jerry Maguire. You complete me. He just made the movie. But your spouse don't complete you. I know. I know. Dog my pay. Okay. Your spouse compliments you if they're not complimenting you they a bad spouse you ain't got to amen me I got a degree I know I'm saying it right <laughs> but listen if I said that my wife completes me then that means that God doesn't that means a sinner doesn't need God because we're saying that all they got to do is get married. And they say, well, this one completes me. God completes me. Because God created me. And there's a void in my life until I acknowledge him as Lord and Savior of my life. There is a void and I need salvation to come in and complete that voidness. And then I am complete in him and complete only in him. My wife doesn't complete me. She compliments me. That's when she says, honey, you look good. That's good complimenting me and when I say you look hot honey that's a compliment it builds up we we build each other up we encourage each other and say honey you got to keep going you then now is not the time to quit we help each other out but God is the one that completes us but the world wants you to think that when you get married that this is the one that completes you Jerry Maguire was a movie not reality show me the money Money ain't going to give you happiness. Because the more you make, the more you want. And the more you have, the more bills you're going to have. Because then you're like, well, I, I, can, I can afford a bigger house. I can afford a bigger car. I can afford all it. And then what begins to happen? Then you get this. And then, well, I can afford two cars now. I can afford, and then before too long, you lose your job. And now you're in debt. And now you just wonder. And then you blame God. Have faith. That God's going to take care of you. But watch this. Beside, God says, besides me, there is no other. We treat God as if he's our second wife. Our second husband. Or our second, if you're not married, your, 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 your extra fling. You better be careful. <laughs> Get myself in trouble. My wife ain't here. I better be careful. But look. Make no mistake about it. He's more than just a little bit of energy. More than just a little bit of electricity. He is sovereign. He is the one that died for you. And you got to have faith that even when everybody else neglects you, he's still there. Even when the world turns its back on you. Even when your family turns its back on you. Because listen, I love this part right here. That everything about God is moving. 
God is moving constantly. He is moving constantly. Every time that you read anything about God, he is moving. When you see him on the point in Genesis 1 and in Genesis uh, chapter 1 verse 2, he is moving in the garden. When you begin to see him on the water, Jesus is moving. When you see him in Revelations, he's moving. When you see him coming down from heaven on the white horse, he's moving. Everything about him is moving. So let me ask you the question, why aren't you moving? Why have we become so stagnated and saying, well, I, you know, he says stand still. And okay, stand still, yes, and wait on him, but your worship should still be moving. Your hands should still be moving. Your lips should still be moving. He said stand still. But he didn't say shut your mouth. He didn't say keep your hands to yourself. I know y'all sound like we in preschool right now, <laughs> and I'm giving the teacher instructions or something, but... God wants you and I to move towards him. And the more that we move to him, the more that he'll move to us. Because, see, he wants you and I to be desiring of him. And if we have faith in him, see that word walk, in this way it says the steps of a good man or righteous man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his ways, and for they that walk in the spirit shall renew their strength. But listen, that word walk in the Greek means to synchronize now that word synchronize and, and talking about walking does not mean I was in the military so you know we you know yeah, I could bring our army veteran over here and, and we could just be like oh well you know we we walk in together you know she's over here she's not running and we're just walking together we're in synchronizations but no that ain't what this means it actually means in a march. So when God says about walking in the spirit, marching means with authority. He wants you marching with authority. So you have to move, and in those steps, you got to be able to march. Why? Because the enemy's coming against you, and he's going to challenge your authority. Do you have authority in God? Yes, I do. Why? How do you know that? Because at the end of the day, I got to have faith that he said I do. And the enemy's going to challenge your faith. And so the question still remains, where is your faith? Today, you got to touch somebody and say, do you got some rhythm? Do you got some synchronization in you? Do you got a march in you? So that when the enemy comes against you, you have the authority. You are a powerful, mighty army in Jesus Christ. So you got to get to the beat. You, you know, man, my mind is going to this. The rhythm is going to get you. The rhythm is going to get you. That's a worldly song. Y'all don't criticize me, but that's where my mind's at right now. But listen, the rhythm of the march of God, there is a march that you and I, we got to get in sync with God. And the enemy's trying to get us distracted over here. Oh, look at that person right there. Can you believe they wore that to church? Can you believe they sing it off tune? Can you believe that they did that to their hair? Can you believe this and can you believe that? And can we not just come to church and worship God? Can we not just come to church and say, can you believe that they're here? Praise Jesus. Can we not just be like the nutty? I'm, I'm, I, I need to get off this stuff. But can we not just be like at the nutty professor and Hercules, Hercules? Can we just not be so super excited that somebody is in the house of God? Can we just not quit being so critical and be so worshipful and say, man, every excuse in the book was thrown our way, but Hercules, Hercules, they're in church. Oh, I need my wife to keep me in check this morning. For it's not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of God. So listen, just think about it like this. Lord, don't, don't just guide me. But give me the strength to be able to pray. Give me the strength to be able to make it. See, the enemy's always going to challenge us. Are we progressive in our walk or are we degressive? Every time I get attacked, am I growing in God or am I shrinking? Am I getting to a place that I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just tired of moving. 
I'm just, every time I get challenged, and if I, I, if I just don't grow, maybe I won't fight as much. Well, isn't that what the enemy wants? Ask yourself the question, would God challenge you to lose you? Or would God challenge you to grow you? The enemy will challenge you for you to lose God. And he'll paint it as if it's God's fault when it's really his fault. And so listen, you got to get to this thing. The Lord is a very present help in time of trouble. Do you believe that? If you believe that, then you got to exercise your faith. You got to understand all of those things. See, a paramedic may come to your neighbor's house and, and, and they may come and assess the situation, and you may begin to pray and ask God to intervene. And God intervenes. Who was the rescuer? Was it God? Was it the paramedics? Or was it both? God honored your prayers. God utilized the paramedics as a tool. In the house of God, God utilizes every one of us to do the work of the Father. He's not just picking on one and exercising or uh, pushing away another one over here. He's wanting to utilize all of us. And this is why we come into the house of God. When we look at all of these things, see the wind is getting stronger and the stronger it gets and the lightning is flashing and all of a sudden the disciples are scared even in the presence of God. And how often have we been guilty of that? God's moving in our midst and yet we're still scared because the imagery that Satan has painted all around us is scarier than the realization that God is here. The one that created all things. And so I brought you this today. And it's simply this. That whenever you've done all that you can do, realize this, you've not lost your mind. It's just time to wake up your Savior. I realize that we want people to sleep. I want him to rest. He don't need rest. He don't. He was the creator of the universe. And I know well, preacher, he said, and, and, uh, and he rested. I, I get that. But you have to understand the contextual aspect of what he was having. He wasn't saying, I wore myself out. You and I need rest because we're human. We deplete our bodies. And if you've not depleted your body to the point that you need rest, come work with some of us for a little bit. I got some stuff I can have you do, and let's see if we'll deplete you. Brother Gary will put you to work, and he'll let you hang some sheetrock, and let's see if we'll deplete your body a little bit. Physically, we can deplete ourselves. Mentally, we can deplete ourselves. But God doesn't need any of that because he's not human. God's wanting you and I to come to him. Come ye all that are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. How can someone that needs rest give you something? He is there because he understands. Listen, it's like this. I don't understand all the things of life. Well, neither do I. I didn't understand what it meant to take care of a baby until I had one. Because for some reason, nobody wrote a book and handed it to a new parent and said, here you go. Jessica, did you get one? You didn't get one. I didn't know if they made one since I had one. No, they don't give you one. They don't tell you about the babies crying in the middle of the night. And they don't tell you about all the needs that the baby has. You got to figure it out for yourself. But there are some storms that nobody can help you with but Jesus. And we rely too much on other people telling us how to do things, and we never listen to God. And we need to get back to the basics. That old Christian song, get back to the basics of life. We need to get back to listening to the voice of God because it's only God that's going to direct our paths. It's only God that's going to help us. I don't know who I've come to preach to today, but you've been listening to too many voices and not the right voice. You need to begin to listen to the voice of God. Don't get so hysterical and moody and want to fight me. I'm just here to deliver a message that God has sent me today. Clean your ears 
so you can hear his voice. Too many will lead you astray. Somehow the storm on the outside has affected the insides of the house. And we have become scattered brain. And see, whenever we get confused, it begins to affect our personality. When we battle the outside components of life, we become moody. I know ain't nobody in the house like that. We become impatient. We snap. I ain't, I ain't looking at nobody. Short-tempered. So our storm affects us. And you got to have faith that God's going to get you through it before it ruins you, ruins those you love. Because at the end of the day, God is able. And I, I wrote this right here. There are three types of peace. There's a peace with God. It means me and God, they're no longer at odds. We're at peace. Peace, peace, wonderful peace. God will give you peace. You, you just got to ask for it. You need peace. Peace, there's peace in God. My God, in him will I trust. It's that peace. And it's that peace that God is going to help you and I with. And if we'll have that peace, everything helps. The Bible actually says, be anxious for nothing. I know we can't fully get to that place. Because we get excited. We get anxious. Oh, I'm anxious. 1159 is fast approaching. And today I thought I was doing good. And my computer was making a noise. I had tapped into the home computer while I was working at the office and it was making a noise. And I did what nobody should do. I hit a button and I lost all my work. And so I'm anxious. And so in between services, I'm going to work like double time, triple time. I need to clone three or four of me to get it done. But I do know that God already knows what I'm going to make on this paper. So I have to trust him that that X that I hit was not on accident. <laughs> and I got to have faith that somehow I'm going to recover that. But sometimes you and I have made mistakes. You didn't mean to. And as soon as you hit the X, you went into panic. Your whole world went into a panic. And you need faith in God to see you through it. And so I, I need to close. If you'll, if you'll come, I, I feel like this is a good stop. When Jesus woke up, Jesus just asked a question, where is your faith? Where's your faith? And I want to pose that question to you today. Where is your faith? We put our faith in a lot of things. Do we really put our faith in God? See, when you put your faith in something, it changes the outcome. We do things without even thinking. You've heard the expression, I mean, we crank up our car. We don't even, we have faith that it's going to turn over. Pull out and we turn the steering wheel and we have faith that it's going to maneuver the way that it's supposed to. When you pray to God, do you have enough faith that he's going to answer? But not answer in the way that we want. Sister Tracy, Brother J.W., I pray that God gives y'all direction. And it may not be the way that 
you want. And even though that's a rarity maybe that you can walk away from something and instantly y'all both agree. I still believe that God is going to show you the right. That when you leave, that no matter what the enemy comes against you at, you can stand firm through faith that this is all the obstacles that y'all had to face. Your faith never wavered. You knew what the Lord told you. And through every step, you held your feet. So when you have faith in something, no matter the storm, it never diminishes. Actually, it's reversed. It actually increases. Because God begins to prove himself little by little. And you know what you know. And as it begins to solidify, and he begins to reveal the big picture, you can step back at the allness of God and say, where is my faith? That even when I wondered at times, he was still. Even when I begin to doubt a little bit, he was still faithful. And so everybody has moments where the water comes in our boat. Everybody has moments where it seems like the boat is about to sink. My question is, how long does it take for you to wake up to God? How long does it take for you to wake up Jesus is in the boat? And so I want you to stand. this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed and please no one looking around maybe this morning you're going through something and you really need God to boost your faith you really need a touch you feel like your boat is sinking waves are crashing this is that moment of all moments that you need God to come and just touch you with an increase of faith. If that's you, I just want you to look this way. Put your head right back down. I see you. I see you. I see you. Yes. I see you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Father, saw the heads I want you right now to move and I know that there are more of us that need you to intervene that we believe but help our unbelief we've been faithful the enemy has raised doubt we've tried to do our best to moments that we know we have failed you but yet you are still faithful we're in this journey with you and we realize that you're there it's taken a while for us to wake you up before the storm gets too bad before the trial gets too hard the circumstance too damaging Father I pray right now that everyone here under the sound of my voice and everyone through social media but especially these that acknowledge that they need a boost in their faith God that they would symbolically reach over and just wake you up. Wake you up. So Father, as I pray, I pray diligently that you would move. 
that your presence would come into their situation. And so, right now, Lord, God, would you wake up as we shake you as passionately as we know how, realizing that the circumstances is way out of our control. We apologize. We've waited so long. We desperately need you to intervene. And in the boat of life, we're sinking. In the same way that you've asked the disciples, where is your faith? God, we acknowledge that our faith at times is low and we're coming to you today saying, God, boost my faith. Boost it. I believe in you. I believe that you're able to intervene in my circumstance in the same way that you were able to speak to the storm, in the same way that you were able to speak to the wind in the waves and they obey, I know that you can speak to the circumstance of each and every one of us today and bring a calmness. Bring healing. Bring restoration. Bring a breakthrough. Bring a word. The troubled spirit that's Plague them. Let it cease right now. The anxiety that seems to be overwhelming, let it be calm right now. The concerns that has caused them to lose sleep and lose hunger all because of the complexity of the situation. God, I pray right now that you would move. Your word simply says, where two or three agree in my name, it shall be done. We come together as a body of believers. Pleading and interceding on behalf of your people. I believe that this is the day. Faith arises faith arises that you're stirring right now Lord that you're moving in an atmosphere and that you're going to begin to change some things and that you're going to begin to stir empower empower right now to move among your people, Lord, we just pray that you would touch and give them the touch that they need. Respond to their petition. Respond to their petition. Respond. Faith tells us to call upon the name of Jesus. So we call upon you right now, Lord, our Father, our Savior, our Lord. We ask you to do great and mighty things. We're believing that you, above all, will do the supernatural simply because we're your children. We're asking you, Lord, we're awakening you because we have faith that you were able. You were able. While you're still in a spirit of praise, our praise team approached me this morning as you know, Sister Scotty is battling chronic kidney disease. They wanted us to do a prayer cloth to send to her. 
So we're going to do that, and then we're going to conclude with communion first of the month. So, uh, Brother Jim, as Sister Scotty's husband, if you'll step forward, we're going to pray. An exercise of faith. The stripes that Sister Carter had made mention of. Stripes. 39. He willfully took for you, for me, all for the sake of healing. And there have been moments that you have had to call upon the name of Jesus and you respond. There have been moments that I've called on Jesus and he responded. Now we have one of our own that needs us. And I don't know what it's like to produce stone after stone after stone. But I do know her heart is to be healed. And we as a church has to do our part to lift her. So would you stretch forth your hands? Father, promises are not slack. The body of believers here today agree that every strike is for the healing of the saints. God, and you know the affliction that her body goes through on a day-to-day basis. And what joy it brings me to know that a church cares about its people enough to bring them to the body of Christ plead and intercede on behalf that healing would occur and so God I pray right now that you would go to where she is at and that you would bring healing virtue from the top of her head to the sole of her feet Lord right now we're believing that she would begin to feel a release God, that this would not be a permanent condition that she has to endure. But Lord, the same way that you was able to walk on this earth and speak to your people that you engage with and said, thy faith has made thee whole. Lord, we're believing even today that her faith and the faith of this church, the faith of her husband, the faith of the saints of God coming to the Father, asking you right now, Lord, would you go and begin to touch her, instantaneously heal her, progressively heal her. Lord, however you see fit, Lord, we know that you're able to touch, restore spiritually, restore physically, restore mentally. Lord, we know it's draining and we know the enemy battles with this over her, but God, we pray a hedge of protection. We pray, God, that you would touch her spouse Pray that you would give him the strength as well, Lord, to engage the battle. The words of encouragement would flow through his mouth and encourage his spouse as he compliments her, as he uplifts her in the time of trouble. God, that you would utilize him. Touch us as a body as we continuously lift up each and every one of us in the midst of our struggles. Jesus give you praise, honor, and glory in your name, in your name. Amen. Amen. That's custom at the first of the month. We want to do communion. something about this time of season I 
I've walked the steps where Jesus walked in Israel. I've gone to the tomb where he lay. And it's one thing to read it in the Bible. It's another thing to see all that's there and and a little bit more realization. But none of us will ever gain the full picture of the price he paid for us. When my dad was stationed in the Philippines, we have slides for the servicemen and those in the Philippines, they would actually depict every year the crucifixion of Christ. And many of those would walk the walk and some would still go all the way to the cross to be hung. Sides pierced. The servicemen would still get their backs flinched with the cat behind the table. They would wear a cover over their face so that they would not be recorded. But they did it for the fact that, that God would do this for me. I got to do it. I wonder how often we can say, God would die for me. Would I die for him? And I pray that that day never comes for us. But in the world that you and I live in, that day is coming. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23, we begin to read where Jesus tells them as often as you get together you do this in remembrance of me. And he tells them, here is the bread, it's broken. He tells them, this is, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often. And we see the blood. He gets to a point. We always do this, and I know Normally I read it, but I'm just going to speak to you today. But we get to a point in Scripture where it says, for you and I to search ourselves. For if one is to partake of communion unworthily, then they bring damnation to themselves. This is how real this is. This is not a snack before you go home. This is serious communion. And so I want to pause before we take communion, and I want to step up and read the, the actual words of Christ before you partake. But I want to caution us and ask us to search ourselves. So if you will, grant me just a moment. Father. Your word tells us that if we partake of communion unworthily, then we bring damnation to ourselves. And I don't believe that anyone here today under the sound of my voice would just willfully do that. But Lord, sometimes we maybe have failed to have sins adequately covered. And so Father, the faith that we talked about today, I pray that you would come and touch us with that. that we believe that you are able to save us. We believe that you're able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as we partake of this communion, we want to partake of it worthily while we realize that none of us are worthy, we do have an opportunity to ensure that there's nothing that would cause us to bring damnation to ourselves. So search us. See if there be any wicked ways in us, Lord, that we might be able to get it covered 
by your blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. That as we partake of the body that was broken and the blood that was shed, that we do it as an honorable thing. As often as we get together, we want to bring honor to you and to the sacrifice that you've done for us. Bless us this day. In your name. Amen. Today, if you would like to partake of the communion, our ushers will be here to serve you. If you will come, we will partake. First Corinthians 11, verse 23 says, For I have received that of the Lord, that which I have commanded of you. That with Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. May we always remember the body, the sacrifice, the brutality that Jesus went through for you in my sin. Would you partake? And in the same manner, he also took the cup. And after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me the blood and only the blood is what saves you and I from our sins would you partake father today we thank you thank you for the, a willfulness to sacrifice your body knowing fully from the very beginning the brutality that you would ensue. That a relationship could be reunited. But, oh, what a cost. More than what money could pay. More than what possessions could give. took the blood of a spotless lamb to wipe away the sins of man and you did it that individuals such as I and these that are here today might be able to come and ask for forgiveness of their sins and know that the blood has never lost its power is able to save that which is lost. Lord, today as we've honored according to your word, the sacrifice, would you bless us? 
give us favor. Move mightily upon us. As we go our separate ways, Lord, this week, would you help us to be intentional about our worship, intentional about our faith, and intentional about the love that not only do we give others, but the love that we give to you because you were intentional about giving us love. Bring us back, Lord, tonight at 6 o'clock, ready to worship. Bless our meeting at 4.30. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. Don't forget to sign up sheets out in the foyer.